On this edition of Manned Space, we orbit Earth with the crew of Apollo 7 on a shakedown flight of the new Apollo spacecraft. In May of 1967, Alan Shepard gave a speech commemorating the sixth anniversary of his flight aboard Freedom 7 that led to him becoming America's first astronaut. Coming only four months since the Apollo 1 launch pad fire that took the lives of Gus Grissom, Ed White, and Roger Chaffee, Shepard proclaimed that the time for recrimination is over. Urging the resumption of Project Apollo, Shepard declared there is much work to be done. Let's get on with the job. In reality, the work of Apollo had continued despite the fire, and by mid-May 1967, a crew was named to fly the first manned mission of the program. Selected to command the flight was Wally Schirra. Schirra had been selected as one of the original seven Mercury astronauts in 1959. He had flown in space aboard Sigma 7 on October 3, 1962, becoming the third American to orbit Earth. Shira returned to space aboard Gemini 6 on December 15, 1965. He was the only astronaut to fly in all three of the Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo programs. Joining Shira for the first man flight to the Apollo program was Don Isley. Part of NASA's third group of astronauts, selected in 1963, Isley had originally been chosen to the primary crew of Apollo 1. But after dislocating his shoulder twice during training, he was replaced by Roger Chaffee. Surgery eventually repaired his injury. The final member of the crew was Walt Cunningham. Like Isley, Cunningham was selected to NASA as part of the third group of astronauts. In preparation for their flight, the crew continued training and monitored construction of their Apollo command and service modules. By the summer of 1968, the Apollo 7 spacecraft arrived at Cape Kennedy and was being readied for an October launch. The flight plan called for the crew to spend 11 days in orbit around Earth, a period of time longer than that necessary to complete a round trip to the moon. Other objectives of the mission included a demonstration of the spacecraft's rendezvous capabilities, as well as evaluation of the spacecraft systems needed to support men and machine during a lunar flight. Countdown for the launch began on October 6, 1968, with a target launch date set for October 11th. On the date appointed for the liftoff, the crew completed breakfast before heading off to be suited up for a launch scheduled for just after 11 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time. The weather that morning was hot, there was a stiff breeze blowing in off the Atlantic Ocean. Safety rules dictated that with an east wind prevailing, the launch be scrubbed lest the spacecraft be blown over land in the event an emergency splashdown was necessary. NASA managers decided to waive the rule and allow the launch to go forward. With the death of Apollo 1 commander and next door neighbor Gus Grissom still on his mind, the safety conscious Commander Shira was not pleased with the decision. He would later admit feeling pressure to proceed with the launch. At 11.02 and 35 seconds a.m. Eastern Daylight Time, the countdown entered its final 10 seconds. Coming up on the 10 second mark. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2. We have ignition. Commit liftoff. We have liftoff. This is launch control. We have cleared the tower. Roger, tower clear. The launch was perfect and the crew continued to soar skyward. The next major event to take place would be staging. That is, the shutdown of the Saturn 1B booster the crew was riding, followed by ignition of the S-4B second stage. Coming up on two minutes, Mark, two minutes. We're having a status check. Apollo 7 has been given a go for staging. Two minutes and 25 seconds after liftoff, the second stage ignited. Three minutes into the launch, Shira reported jettison of the launch escape tower, a system designed to launch an Apollo spacecraft clear of an exploding launch vehicle in the event of a catastrophic failure. Ten and a half minutes after launch, the crew reported shutdown of the second stage engine. Instantly, they went from over two and a half Gs to zero. They had successfully achieved orbit. The next major objective of the Apollo 7 mission was to test the command service module's ability to maneuver while still attached to the spent S-4B stage. 
Once the crew had successfully demonstrated the spacecraft's ability to perform these maneuvers, it was time to undock from the S-4B in preparation for a planned rendezvous. Following separation, the crew fired the Command Service Module's small rockets to place them about 50 feet ahead of the S-4B. They then turned their spacecraft around to simulate rendezvous and docking, maneuvers necessary to extract a lunar module for future lunar flights. Within the first three hours of the mission, Apollo 7 had achieved two major objectives of the flight. The crew then settled in for lunch, enjoying the first hot meal ever eaten by American astronauts in space. At 14 hours 46 minutes ground elapsed time, it was reported that Commander Shira had developed a head cold. By the next day, Cunningham and Isley also experienced head colds. Then, 23 hours and 33 minutes into the flight, Shara delayed without further discussion what was to be the first live television transmission from space by an American crew. Six hours later, Apollo 7 was closing in on the 59-foot S-4B stage it had jettisoned one day earlier. Apollo 7 Houston, uh, how close are you now? We're close to about, uh, oh, about 70 feet. It's tumbling rather wildly, so we should have to stay away from it. All right, you understand. The rendezvous proved the Apollo spacecraft's ability to maneuver in order to rescue an ailing lunar module during an actual flight to the moon, thus achieving another major objective of the Apollo 7 mission. Then, nearly 50 hours since the original transmission was canceled, the crew of Apollo 7 employed the use of an RCA camera to beam the first television broadcast from space. Hey, we got you. I can see Isley talking there. Hey, Don, turn your head to the right. There you go. The definition is pretty good down here. I can see the center hatch. In a moment of levity and in an homage to the big band radio broadcast of the 1930s, Isley displayed a card that read, From the lovely Apollo room, high atop everything. The crew closed out the first TV transmission by displaying a final card, read in Houston by capsule communicator Tom Stafford. Keep those cards and letters coming in, folks. It's loud and clear. The crew performed daily broadcasts from their spacecraft for the duration of the flight, holding up additional cards and educating viewers about spaceflight. For their efforts, the crew received a special Emmy Award. On eight separate occasions during the course of the 11-day mission, the crew fired the spacecraft's service propulsion system. The big engine located at the rear of the spacecraft necessary to travel to and from the moon. It performed flawlessly. For its part, the command module also performed with near perfection. The cabin remained comfortable during the flight, although coolant lines sweated and water collected on the deck. The crew used the urine dump hose to vacuum the water and purge it from the spacecraft. As for the crew, a packed flight plan, sleep difficulties, and head colds definitely impacted their mood, if not their performance. Commander Shira was still unhappy about the decision to launch, despite marginal wind conditions. As the time for re-entry approached, conflict between the crew and mission controllers in Houston reached a boiling point. With head colds in full bloom, the crew refused to don their helmets as required by mission rules for fear they might sustain permanent injury to their ears. In a rare turn of events, Director of Flight Crew Operations Deke Slayton radioed the crew from Houston in an effort to get them to change their minds. The three men would not be deterred. As they readied for splashdown, they announced they would not wear the helmets and instead agreed to take decongestions one hour before re-entry. Attention then turned to preparations for the re-entry and splashdown in the Atlantic Ocean. Just a final update on the weather and the recovery area. 2,000 broken, winds 270 at 20, wave height is 3 feet. During the 163rd orbit and over Hawaii, the crew fired the service propulsion system for the eighth and final time in order to slow the vehicle for re-entry. The crew splashed down 200 nautical miles from Bermuda and 7 nautical miles from the recovery vessel USS Essex. The difficulties between the crew and mission control aside, 
the flight of Apollo 7 was widely considered a success, having achieved most, if not all, of its objectives. Don Isley would later admit, we were insolent, high-handed, and Machiavellian at times. He concluded, it got the job done. No member of the Apollo 7 crew ever returned to space. Do you remember the flight of Apollo 7? Maybe you watched the first television transmission. Please share your memories in the comments section. Thanks again for watching Man's Space. Please be sure to click the like button if you enjoyed this edition of Man's Space. Also, please be sure to subscribe and click the notification button to see more upcoming videos on the history of the early days of the Man's Space program.